Hello everyone and welcome back to the Hammond Corner. In today's video, we have an introduction into the coinage of James II. But just before we get into it, be sure to leave a like on the video and subscribe so you never miss a video here on the channel. On the screen now, you can see display timestamps so you can easily refer to certain parts of the video in the future. So before we jump straight into the different coins that were minted during his reign, who was James II and what makes his numismatic history so interesting? James was a Stuart King of England, Scotland and Ireland who in 1688 was overthrown in the Glorious Revolution by William III. James was born on the 14th of October 1633 to Charles I and his French wife Henrietta Maria and was named after his grandfather James I and VI. During the English Civil War he was captured but fled to exile. He distinguished himself a soldier returning to England at the restoration of his brother Charles II in 1660. In 1660, James married Anne Hyde, daughter of Charles II's chief minister, and they had two surviving children, Marie and Anne. In 1669, James converted to Catholicism and took a stand against a number of anti-Catholic moves, including the Test Act of 1673. This did not impede his succession to the throne on Charles's death in 1685, but later that year, James faced rebellion, led by Charles II's illegitimate son, Duke of Monmouth. In June 1688, James' second wife, Mary of Medina, gave birth to a son, James Francis Edward. Fearing that a Catholic succession was now assured, a group of Protestant nobles appealed to William of Orange, husband of James's older and Protestant daughter, Mary. In November, William landed with an army in Devon. Deserted by an army and navy, James completely lost his nerve and fled abroad. In February 1689, Parliament declared that James's flight constituted an abdication and William and Mary were crowned joint monarchs. In March 1689, James landed in Ireland, where, with French support, he raised an army. He was defeated by William at the Battle of Boyne in July 1690, and James died in exile in Saint-Germain in France on the 16th of September 1701. So that was a little about the history of James's short reign, but what makes his three-year numismatic history so unique? Well, he issued a currency called gun money, which we will be covering a little bit later on. When James fled to France and decided to try and take the throne back by force, he rallied men in Ireland, but had no way of paying them. So he issued gun money, deriving from the origin of the metal, coming from old guns and other scrap. They were minted with a date and a month, so that afterwards they could be traded for silver with interest from that specific month. For example, a shilling with January on could be redeemed in April for three months wages on that particular coin, only on the basis that King James II won and became king, of which he did not. So at this point in history, there were no longer any hammered coins in circulation. So we will first look at the gold milled coins minted during James's reign. So firstly, we have the largest and most expensive coins that were produced, the five guinea piece. The king now faces left with the reverse seeing the scepters between shields only minted for two years between 1686 and 1687. These had two bust variants, the laurel head one and two. These coins go in very fine condition between 85 to 90,000 pounds. We then have the much rarer five guinea piece with the elephant and castle provenance marks that are valued around £95,000 in extremely fine condition, and all valuations are cited from the Sphinx 2021 book. The provenance marks signify that the gold used was mined in the English colonial-owned parts of Africa company. We then have the two guinea piece, with a crown cruciform shield, scepters and angles, and milled edge, minted between 1687 and 1688. We then have the guinea, minted in all four dates during his three-year reign, Examples also with the provenance mark two, And finally we have the half guinea. So a very short and brief list, which best matches his reign altogether really. So now we move on to the silver coins minted during his reign. Many of these coins have lots of variants, with variations in edge inscriptions, errors or bust design. That is what makes the early milled coin is so infectiously interesting to collect. So starting with the largest denomination we have the crown, and unlike the guinea, bears no scepters between angles. Prices of these are valued between £6,750 to £8,500. We then have the half crown, with lots of overdate variants to collect. Prices are valued between £4,750 to £5,250 in extremely fine condition. 
but a very fine example will set you back between five to nine hundred pounds. We then have my favourite denomination, the shilling, with prices ranging from three to three and a half thousand pounds in extremely fine condition, or you could find a very fine example for around seven hundred pounds. There is an extremely rare shilling with a plume in the centre of the shield on the reverse, where a very fine example will set you back £20,000 if you can find one, that is. The sixpence, where a very fine example will cost around £450. And finally, we have the more common Maundy set. The Maundy set consists of four coins. The fourpence, the threepence, the tuppence, and a penny. Examples of each in very fine condition are valued in the book at around 40 to 50 pounds. So if you'd like to get an example of this coinage without spending a small fortune, this is a great place to start. Now I did have a very poor example of a James II groat and threepence that I passed on recently, but I do have a gun money shilling that you all saw at the very beginning. Maybe one day I'll add a silver shilling to my shilling collection, but for now this example is perfectly fine. He then issued a tin halfpenny and farthing, produced in tin with a copper plug to counter the counterfeit that was circulating at the time. But a non-corroded, extremely fine example will set you back three to four thousand pounds. So now we have the very small amount of coins minted during James's reign in Scotland. During this period, there were only ever silver coins minted, of which our first and largest coin, the 60 shilling piece, was not issued at the time of James's reign, but was in fact later struck in 1828 by Matthew Young or these are the only examples known. And even though these aren't contemporary examples, a silver example would still set you back 3,000, whereas the extremely rare gold example would set you back 75,000 pounds. And during his reign, a reduction in weight of the coins made the proportions from Scottish to English a little over 13 to one, as against the 12 to one from the accession of James VI. We then have the contemporary 40 shilling piece, where a very fine example will set you back around 900 pounds. And finally, a 10 shilling piece, where we see a cross between shields with a thistle, a harp, a rose and a lily on each end. So unfortunately, that is where the Scottish pieces stop. And although there are a few variations of the 40 and 10 shilling, there isn't a whole lot to sink your teeth into. So now we get into the Irish coinage, where we will go into the most popular coinage, the gun money issue. In 1685, James II transferred the unexpired patent for the minting halfpence to Sir John Knox, the Lord Mayor of Dublin, and these were issued in 1688. We see a new style of bust on the obverse and the crowned Irish harp on the reverse, with the legend and date too. And boy do I love the Irish harp designs on the hammered and early milled coins, some of my absolute favourites. It's just a shame I don't collect a lot of non-silver coins. After drumming up Catholic support on the continent, James landed in Ireland in March 1689 to continue his struggle and regain power. Having insufficient funds to prosecute the war, a plan was devised to issue official base metal token coins, which would be exchanged for sterling silver after the war was won, and a nominal month as well as a year inscribed on them, so they could be redeemed in stages over a period of time. The coins were made from brass, from old cannons, bells, and other scrap metal that were called brass money, though they later became known as gun money. And an interesting fact, because the new year commenced on the 25th of March, when following the older calendar, coins minted in March 1689 and 1690 were actually minted in the same month. That is also why coins dated December 1689 was followed by January 1689. So what denominations were minted? Well, we have the largest coin minted, the crown, with James now on horseback on the obverse, and the Irish, French, Scottish and English coat of arms minted between 1689 to 1690. We then have the half crown that have an incredible amount of variations for you to collect, where an extremely fine example will cost you around £400. We no longer see the coat of arms on the reverse. Instead, we see a crown with cross scepters, the initials JR for James Rex or King James, the coins denomination on the top XXX or 30 pence or two shillings and six pence, and finally the month of issue at the bottom. These half crowns come in two issues, large and small, getting smaller near the end of minting. We then have the shillings, with many variations, dates and designs, as well as being minted in large and small flans too. We finally have the six pence that bears the same designs as the half crown and shilling. Now I don't know about you, but would you accept work in return for payment if your employer was to achieve victory and no employment if they lost? I probably wouldn't, 
But I guess if a once king asks you to help him, a fellow Catholic, you're going to help as much as you can. Let me know what you would have done in that situation. And finally, we have the emergency pewter money of 1689 to 1690 that was issued after brass coinage was despised by the government and was slowly rendered void. So they had to issue an emergency coinage for everyday transactions and to pay his troops. But as time went on, James demanded that brass was to be accepted as legal tender to the same value as silver up until his victory. But this wasn't accepted by many and most places didn't accept brass as a payment in the end. And as time went on, the government stopped accepting taxes in brass where silver and gold were also available. And when William III defeated James in Ireland, he reduced the value of brass and pewter and left £22,000 worth at the mint. But after the value of a crown was reduced to only a penny, the new worth of the metal went from 22000 to £642. So the denominations are the crown, the pattern groat, the penny and the half penny. A fantastic piece of numismatic history and I hope you all enjoyed the introduction into the coinage of James II slash 7th. Be sure to let me know down below what coins you have from his reign and what coin you'd like to acquire in the future. Thank you all for your continued support and as always, keep collecting!